Well, greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining another episode of Live with the Infidel Guy. Actually, this is a special broadcast today. We're having a special debate slash discussion with two individuals about an article. Richard Carrier, he's been on the show previously, and Richard Carrier has written an article, I'm sorry, an essay entitled Cosmology and the Quran. And our other guest, who is also with us, is Nadir Ahmed, and he has something to say about Richard Carrier's essay. Now, once again, this is an informal debate and discussion. It's going to be about also, hopefully we can delve into some other things as well, um, hopefully outside the this essay if we have time. This isn't our show, so hopefully, hopefully we'll have some time. And uh, we have a discussion about the Quran as well as many other claims that maybe Muslim apologists as well as other maybe uh, Islamic experts have made on uh, about science in the Quran and things of that nature. You can join us right now in the chat room. If you're listening to this feed anywhere else, please visit infidelguy.com. Click on the chat room there. Toward the end portion of this broadcast, we will have a question and answers session in which you can just simply call in, not right now, I will let you know when you can call in, and you can call in and uh, ask us questions. The uh, Whoever you ask the question to, that person will be able to respond and also will allow if the other guest wants to respond to that question, we'll also allow that to happen as well. Well, okay. Without further ado, once again, we have Richard Carrier on the line as well as uh, Nadir Ahmed. Welcome to uh, this program, gentlemen. Oh, nice to be here. Thanks. Uh, you're very welcome. Glad to have you guys on here. In terms of why I'm down this end. There we go. Much better. Okay. Uh, first of all, with Richard Carrier, um, maybe you can tell us more about this uh, essay of yours, Cosmology in the Quran. Right. Um, in, in the essay in question, I address the claim that the Quran miraculously predicted the findings of modern science. Um, I make many general points, and then I explore one example in depth, which is the claim that the Quran predicted modern Big Bang Theory in verse 4111. Okay. Uh, I think the general points are more important than the specifics. Uh, I imagine Nadir will probably get into the specifics, so uh, I'll just summarize the general points right now. Uh, there are five problems with this kind of argument that I mentioned in my essay, and it's worth writing this list down, so, so get a pencil ready. Okay. Uh, first is the problem of exegesis. Mm-hmm. Second is the problem of ambiguity. Third is the problem of borrowing. Fourth is the problem of triviality. And fifth is the problem of error. Okay, first is the problem of exegesis. I don't call it that in the essay, but it's the same principle. Uh, the question is, what is the correct interpretation of the Quran? What did its authors originally mean? Uh, it appears in examples like this uh, that anything is allowed to be read in any way the Muslim needs in order to make it fit modern science. Um, we call that retrofitting, and that's one of the concerns I raise in the essay. Uh, to overcome this problem, you have to read the text in its simplest and plainest sense without importing any assumptions. Uh, if you have to make all sorts of assumptions, then you're no longer talking about what the text says, but what you want it to say. That's one of the general points I made. Uh, second is the problem of ambiguity. Um, the verses cited are, are often ambiguous, imprecise, uh, and inherently non-scientific. That is, they include no mathematics, no precision of definition or detail, uh, but these are fundamental requirements of any text claiming to be scientific. As I see it, uh, a god should be able uh, to uh, should be capable of far more impressive miracles, like actually stating a mathematical law or stating a constant of several decimal places or giving a precise description of some fact or process. Instead, we get far less inspiring predictions, uh, as we all see in this one example. And that's more in line with human origins than something from a god. Uh, and that's another point I make in the essay. So you need very pre- clear, precise, proto-scientific passages even to attempt the claim that the Quran contains miraculous prediction of current science. Um, I, I doubt there's even one passage that meets that criterion, but certainly the one passage I examined does not meet that qualification. Okay. Okay. Third is the problem of borrowing. Um, mm-hmm. Most of the science found, quote unquote, in the Quran is stuff already known or believed for centuries before the Quran. Uh, this knowledge was transmitted by books as well as orally, uh, and it was taught. 
caught, along with regular literate education, right into the Middle Ages. Uh, it also filtered into popular oral culture and artwork. And it was maintained uh, among doctors and astrologers especially, uh, two groups almost everyone had contact with, even as far off as India. So it can't be ruled out that the authors of the Quran heard or learned this stuff from their surrounding culture or from multicultural contacts. So we cannot be certain uh, they got it from God. Uh, I mean, I already think it's strange that a God would provide miraculous knowledge that wasn't in fact miraculous, but stuff that had already been discovered or conjectured by pagans already. Uh, so one has to show that something said in the Quran was not already said by other people centuries before, or that there's no way the authors of the Quran could have had contact with this tradition. Uh, but I don't know how you can prove that. I mean, can you really prove they never talked to doctors or astrologers or mm -hmm. scholars, that they never heard of such things in popular culture or saw them in popular art? Uh, I don't see that proof being likely. So that's another point I raise. Uh, fourth is the problem of triviality. Um, the fact is, the ancient Greeks correctly anticipated hundreds of future scientific discoveries. And they often did so without doing any experiments, sometimes without doing any real science at all. But of course, the Muslim can't claim that they were being miraculously inspired by their pagan gods, since that contradicts Islam. So, since ordinary uninspired humans could anticipate hundreds of scientific advances, even if we found other anticipations in the Quran, after overcoming somehow all the other four objections I just summarized, even that does not mean these anticipations were divinely inspired any more than the Greeks were divinely inspired. So you have to show a scientific claim that could not be anticipated by human reason alone, and that's not easy to show, especially for an ambiguous passage, uh, like the one in question. And finally, uh, fifth is the problem of error, and this is probably uh, what Nadir wants to focus on. It's the last claim I make in my essay, which is that if we're looking at a miraculous text, there should be no mistakes at all. Uh, yet the Quran clearly gets some scientific facts wrong, at least if you interpret the passage that I analyze in the way you have to in order to get it to be about the Big Bang. But if the Quran is wrong, that refutes any claim to being miraculous. So you have to prove there are no errors in the text, and that's pretty hard to do. And in this particular case, uh, I, I think it's very hard to do. Um, so for all five of these reasons, which I mentioned in my essay, uh, I don't believe the Quran miraculously predicts any modern science, especially not in the passage I discussed. And that's basically what the essay is about. Uh, okay. so that's the end of my summation. Okay. And um, now, dear Ahmed, you have some opposition to Richard's uh, essay. Um, what exactly do you do you do you find uh, incorrect or disturbing or about this uh, about Richard's essay? What, what, what would you have to, to share with us? Well. Um yeah, basically, you know, um, I'll get into addressing all his points, which he meant about exegesis, ambiguous, borrowing, trivial, and error, late, you know, later on in our discussions, because I guess it's going to be hard to explain everything right now. But, um, you know, I think that, um, that you know, critique is very good when it comes to religion. And I don't know if your experience has been like mine, but I think when I look at um, organized religion, I find that, most religions tend to kind of shy away from critique, which actually what uh, Richard's article is, uh, basically trying to point out there's the gross errors in the Quran and etc. Um, and you know, from my experience, what I find is that um, most belief systems they don't really tend to uh, allow people to question their faith or to entertain any kind of debate which would question their belief system, and they may even go as far as saying that the, per the questioner is somehow demon-possessed or, you know, something like that. But when I read the Quran, I find a different attitude towards, you know, criticism and the discussion like we are going to have tonight. Um, what I see is actually the Quran, it invites criticism. This is what I understand from uh, chapter 4, verse 82, and I'm going to be very careful uh, not to retrofit, uh, as, uh, <laughs> you know, as Richard was mentioning, which a lot of people tend to do. I think Christians, Muslims, and atheists, sometimes they tend to read more into the scripture than what's actually there. Mm. So basically, um, the verse says over there that do they not consider the Quran carefully? Had it been from others than Allah, they would surely have found therein much contradictions. So, or, or discrepancies. So some of the principles which a person can derive from this one verse is that the Quran is actually inviting people to come and to question it. And it is opening itself up for criticism. And a person can approach the Quran even for the mere purpose of trying to disprove it, trying to find some error or contradiction in it. Contradiction in it. Just like as Richard mentioned that a book of God, it doesn't contain mistakes and errors. 
And then it, it sums it up in the end by, by stating that after the person has conducted his research, he's going to find that the Quran contains no errors and contradictions. And this is one of the signs that this is a book of God. So, um, you know, it, so just to sum up that one point, it does welcome criticism. And Islam is not something which is based upon blind faith. And, uh, and uh, based on my incomplete research of religions, I see that the Quran is really the only book which actually invites people to criticize it. Uh, but then again, like I said, I haven't examined every single uh, scripture out there, so I don't know, maybe a question, a, you know, person from the question and answer line, or maybe Richard can enlighten me if there are uh, any other books like that. Um, so basically, you know, having said all that, I, I'd like to uh, welcome and thank uh, Richard for his uh, critique tonight. Okay. Oh. Well, gentlemen, I guess at this point of the program, thanks to the uh, both sides have produced intros here, I guess uh, maybe, Richard, you can pick it up at this point, and we can go back and forth, and we can see what uh, what can be revealed here. Uh, well, actually, Nadir, why don't you have yeah, it I think uh, Yeah, let me, let me uh, pick it up, start it off, because that way, you know, I can ask Richard a question, and, you know, then he can yeah. give an answer. Yeah, indeed. Ask. Okay. Sounds great. Yeah. Um, okay, Richard, um, inside your article, uh, you mentioned, uh, you made an issue about the six days. Uh, you know, that the Quran, and I guess what you quoted, uh, what I'm quoting you here in the paper, it says, the Quran repeats through, throughout that Allah created everything in six days. And then you go on to mention that this could not mean a uniform duration period of time. It has to mean a 24-hour period. Did I, did actually, I understand actually, that? No, I, I, I don't. Actually, oh. I, I'm one of the few people who doesn't insist on that. Oh. Uh, I, I'm willing to allow that day might be a metaphor for something else. Um, but the, the problem is, of course, uh, if you insert it in any uniform amount, like say it's a billion years, mm -hmm. whatever you do to set it as a, uh, if it's a uniform amount for each time the word appears, uh, then it doesn't work out mm -hmm. mathematically. Mm -hmm. um, and if, of course, if you can put a different amount wherever you want, you know, that's retrofitting. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, I think, uh, you know, when I, when I see the word day, I, when I look at there, at the word day in the Quran, really, when I read it, I really cannot say what a period of time it is because, you know, I'm sure you must have read in other places in the verse, uh, other places in the Quran, it says in like chapter 22, verse 47, that uh, the, that a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. And then it says inside chapter 70, verse 4, uh, a day measure whereof is 50,000 50, years. Uh, so 50 or 15? 50. 50. Yeah, 50,000 years. So when we see that, I see here the day is kind of being used as a variable to fit in certain amount periods of time. So when I see day over there, I, I, yeah, I guess we really can't say exactly that it's a 24-hour period of time, but we cannot assign it a time just for, uh, for it to fit modern science. Yeah, so I guess we both kind of see eye to eye on that, I, I guess, right? Uh, yeah, to an extent. I, yeah. We have a middle ground there, certainly. Yeah. And actually, uh, you know, I wanted to mention something about, I guess one of the main focuses of the article is that uh, this is actually a response to another Muslim website who tried to show that um, there is a particular verse in the Quran which shows that the universe existed, you know, in a gaseous state, and, act and the Quran actually uh, agrees with that statement. And then, he and I guess I would agree with you that that particular verse is vague and ambiguous. Yeah. Because um, basically, what he's doing that because the word it, it says smoke, he says this is uh, an analogy for gases, and it's very hard to make that jump. So I'm going to agree with you on that. Yeah. But the uh, the actual claim appears on several uh, web pages written by different people, and I believe, although I haven't traced it, uh, I believe it comes from a variety of books that were actually published uh, in in the uh, in the Middle East and are still in circulation now uh, by some you know quote unquote Muslim scholars uh, that list like hundreds and hundreds of these scientific predictions. This being one of them, mm -hmm. uh, and I just think it gets repeated repeatedly on the website, which is why I didn't specify a particular person I was criticizing. It's just the claim, because it crops up everywhere. It's not just one guy who has this on his website. Okay. But uh, let me also say that I do believe that uh, there are uh, many verses in the Quran which do agree with uh, modern science, which has just been discovered today. But uh, that doesn't automatically make it the Word of God. As you mentioned, there could be several possibilities for that. Right, yeah. Could it be that the person, you know, met with doctors or scientists, or he was a doctor or scientist himself, etc., stuff like that. Uh, but I guess, you know, to make a case for showing all the verses which agree with science, 
uh, I think that's kind of like out of the scope for today's discussion because this is more focused on uh, this article over here. So I would like to maybe in another sitting we can go over that because I believe that when you examine everything, then a person, it is a very, it is the most reasonable conclusion that a person would come to is that uh, this, is, this is not the author of a man 1,400 years ago because there's just too much information which is relating with modern science, etc. So, Well, we, uh, we might have time to go uh, wider ranging later on. Okay. Certainly. Yeah, but I, I figure if we want to really do justice to the topic, uh, you know, maybe we could make a separate time to, to talk about that, maybe you and me. And, yeah, well, let's see yeah. how far we... we uh, and by, by the way, Richard, could you pick up this one particular essay, I guess. Right. Okay. Hey, Richard, could you pick your volume up just a little bit for us, oh, please? Am just I dropping out? Yeah, you drop now, just a little. Uh, how's that? That's a little bit better. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let me then uh, go ahead and move on to my next point over here. And this is dealing with, uh, with uh, actually, there's a correction I wanted to make on your, on, on your essay. And um, basically, I guess the main focus point of this article uh, was take, was from chapter 41, verse 9 to 41, 12. That's the example I use, yeah. Yeah, and um, I think to give clarity on this verse over here, you would have to go back and read uh, verse 229 over there. Uh, did you want to read sorry, the verses for uh, everyone? or 2, two uh, colon 29? Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, did you want to read verse 41, 9 to 41, 12 to, um, for the people? And just yeah, sure. Case? Well, yeah, all right. Okay. Uh, I'm yeah. going to leave out the parenthetical comments. Okay. Um, say, do you verily disbelieve in him who created the earth in two days, and you set up rivals with him? That is the Lord of the Alam. He placed therein firm mountains from above it, and he blessed it, and measured therein its sustenance in four days equal, for all those who ask. Then he rose over toward the heaven when it was smoke, and said to it and to the earth, Come both of you willingly or unwillingly. They both said, We come willingly. Then he completed and finished from their creation seven heavens in two days, and he made in each heaven its affair. And we adorned the nearest heaven with lamps to be an adornment as well as to guard, such as the degree, the decree of him, uh, the Almighty, the All-Knower. Okay, yeah, and um, I guess to give clarity on verse uh, 4111 and 4112, if you read uh, Surah 229, it says over there that it is, he, it is he who has created for you all that is on earth. Then he Ishtawa rose over toward the heaven and made them seven heavens as he is the all-knower of everything. So what I wanted to point out from this one verse is that there is a process of the heaven becoming seven heavens. Now what it means, I have no idea. And I just leave it at that. So... When we come to the verse over here, we see the same thing inside 41.11. He rose toward the heaven when it was smoke and said to it and to the earth, Come both of you willingly and unwillingly. They both said, We come willingly. Then inside verse 12 it says, Then he completed and finished from their creation as seven heavens in two days. So basically it's restating what was basically said inside 2.29. Now in your exegesis of this verse, uh, you wrote that... Um, but we see inside 411 establishes an undeniable context. And then you go on later, more lower in the paragraph, it says, the earth had to exist while the heavens were smoke. And what I wanted to point out to you is that at this point in verse 11, the heaven was not heavens. It was still heaven. So probably you might want to do correct that right over there. Uh, wait, do I, I, I use the plural later on? Is that what yes. you're saying? Um, I'll look into that because that, that's just... Uh a trivial typo. Well, okay, and also, um, and then I guess later on inside uh, inside the article, I guess another point which you bring up is that, uh, and I guess I'll just quote your essay over here. It says, uh, it gets worse. Uh, uh, verse 41.12 describes in no uncertain term the last two days of the six days of creation. Since it says that, uh, that these two days, the creation was completed and finished, yet it was only then that the stars, the lamps, are made. This completely reverses scientific reality. Earth could not possibly have existed before the stars. No planet could. So uh, I guess when I read this, what I, 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 I don't believe that the Quran is saying that the stars was created, um, you know, after the Earth. Um, and this is, I think, you know, in like these type of studies, it's, 
it's so important to pay attention to detail. When we read in the Quran, we read that there, it has been used at least, the word created has been used at least, at least 200 times in the Quran. You know, in several examples. For example, in 229, it is, it is He who has created you uh, for for you. He is He who has created for you all that is on earth. Inside, you know, 359, it says He created him from dust, and it goes on and on and on about He created this and that and that. Um, and the word there, you know, you read it's Khalakna, or you know, Khalakal Insan, meaning He created man. But right. when we come to verse 4112. It does not say that that he created the stars. The word there is not chalakna; it is um, zayanna, which means to beautify, to or you know, as it correctly translated, adorn. So then, the you know, we read the verse here. It says, "Then he completed and finished from their creation as seven heavens in two days, and he made in each heavens its affair. And we adorned the nearest heaven with lamps to be an adornment as well as a guard." So here it doesn't say anything about the stars being created. It's just saying that this is how it was beautified. As for when the actual stars was created, you know, the Quran doesn't give that information. And and since the Quran used the word create 200 times in the book, then, you know, I'm sure if the author meant that this is creating, he would have used it here. But he instead he used a different word, zayanna, which means to beautify. So well, I could you... Uh, well, the yeah. way I see it, uh, and at what I brought up in the uh, in the, my introduction is you can't really import too many assumptions. You have to go on what the plain reading is. Mm -hmm. And what we see here, first of all, forty one nine says uh, he created the earth in two days. Forty one ten he puts things on the earth in, in two more days. Uh, so already we're we're looking at a, a chronological order. And so there's only two days left. So then he goes on and talks about creating, uh, for bringing the heaven and the earth together, and then creating seven heavens. So the plain reading is that we have a chronological order. Um, there are other reasons why we want to conclude that a chronological order is, meaning, is meant here. Um, the universe is still smoke when the Earth is made. So clearly uh, you couldn't have the universe differentiated into stars and, and other things until after that event. So that's another reason we've got chronological order. Um, then uh, the, the word there, you know, it's completed. Uh, that also implies that, that we're looking at the end of things here. Um, also, uh, when we do, when we add up the mass, you know, Earth took two days, uh, and the universe is still smoke then. Plants and mountains took two days, so only two days are left. So again, we got the heavens and stars in those next two days, uh, and there's no real logical reason to have them all out of order here. I mean, why, why would they be listing them this way, which is clearly in a logical order uh, that looks chronological, but then not really mean that without qualifying? You know, it seems uh, very imprecise. Another reason, now you mentioned uh, you didn't know why the seven heavens, you didn't know what that meant. Well, as, as I note in my essay, there, that's, that's a clue right there that gets a giveaway uh, that this creation account is really borrowed from pagan mythology because the seven heavens is a standard light motif throughout uh, pagan religion. Uh, it was adopted by Christianity. Uh, it was a standard in astrology, uh, especially in uh, the uh, Arabian and Babylonian areas. Uh, where, where there's a lot of um, syncretization and, and cultural mixing. Uh, and astrology was super popular. And uh, so through all of the religions that were going at the time, the seven heavens is a standard motif. So here we have it seeing in the, we see it in the Quran. That's a dead giveaway because it's written in the very time when the seven heavens had a meaning. And these are basically the seven, uh, well, they're, they're sometimes divided by spheres because people thought the planets and rotated on spheres, but I won't assume that here. But basically the idea was the first heaven was the moon, the second heaven was the sun, uh, then you had uh, Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and then when you add them all up, it comes to seven. And these are the seven heavens. So the, whenever you see someone talking about the seven heavens in the ancient world, uh, you immediately know they're talking about uh, the planets, basically, and the sun. Um, and then uh, normally it's the, the seventh heaven, the last heaven that has all the stars attached to it, here, the stars are being attached to the first heaven. Uh, but e either way, the idea is when you see the seven heavens being mentioned, uh, I mean, that's, that's a giveaway. It tells you that they're talking about the creation of the planets, of the things that move in, in, uh, against the night sky, uh, because that's what everybody else meant by the seven heavens. And since the author of the Quran didn't make any clarification, oh, he didn't say, oh, I mean seven heavens, something else than everybody else around me means. 
because he didn't qualify it that way, clearly he meant the same thing everybody else means when they talk about the seven heavens. So we take all of these things together. Uh, really, a chronological order is the only way to read this passage. Uh, well, yeah, you, the, the point you made about, you know, borrowing from pagan religions, um, I'll get to that in a second, but I just wanted to point out to you that, you know, what I see is that there are a lot of people who try to retrofit, as you mentioned, and try to make seven heavens mean what it wants to themselves. You know, like, for example, some say the seven heavens are seven state of minds or, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. But they're in the Quran, what the heaven is, there's no definition for that. So when you, so what I, you know, the way I try to interpret Quran, when there's no explanation, don't use guesswork or make up stuff, leave it alone. And now when we come to the word heaven, it is, you know, it says that the heaven was uh, turned into seven heavens. So the universe has already existed over here. Sure. And I agree with you. It's chronological. That is the right, correct interpretation, I think, is how you're doing it. But it says here, let me read it to you again. Right. The istawa toward the heaven when it was smoke. The universe is already there. And to and even that is kind of an interpretation to say heaven means universe, but it seems most likely yeah. here. So I, yeah. I'll grant that. Yeah. And said, and it said, and it said, uh, okay, and said to it, and to the earth, come both of you willingly or unwillingly. They both said we come willingly. Then he completed and finished from their creation as seven heavens in two days. So now the seven heavens have been uh, create, have been finished creating. That's what it says over here. And he made in each heaven its affair. Okay. Then it goes on. And we adorn the nearest heaven with lamps. Again, if you read this, it says nothing about stars being made. It well, one, one wonders the where stars. the stars were if he's only now adorning at the end. I mean, if the stars were already there, then mm -hmm. he hasn't actually done anything at the end. Right. Well, uh, see, here's the thing. When the stars are created, it doesn't give you that information inside the Quran. But Therefore, on, on the plain reading, you can say that if he adorns, I mean, that's simply a metaphor for creation, because if the stars were already there, then he isn't doing anything, and there wouldn't be any reason for a verb there. So on, on the plain plain English, I mean, it's a fair thing to say. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, my essay doesn't hinge on that too much. Um, uh, the, the, I mean, really, whether you want to emphasize stars or not, mm -hmm. you really have to stick back to seven heavens. And what's standard in, in historical interpretation of documents is, is that you, you know, no document is written in isolation. It's not written in a vacuum. You, you don't just read it and say that oh, I can't import anything from outside of this. What you can import are basically the assumptions of the time when it was written. And you have to do that in order to translate it. I mean, if you want to know what certain words mean, you have to look at other Arabic texts written at the same time. Um, and there's no other way to translate this. You have to look at the historical context. You have to look at what these things mean in that context. And so when we see this, this light motif, the seven heavens, when we see that, we know throughout uh, his time and place that this meant something. And we know what it meant. Uh, and he doesn't make any effort to say, oh, oh, by the way, I don't mean what everybody else means. Clearly, he means what everybody else means because he doesn't, he doesn't qualify it. I mean, he's using the language and the terminology of his time and era. Uh, so when we can look historically at what that terminology meant in his time and era, and so that's a fair importation. It's not an assumption. Uh, it's basically translation. It's, it's doing what you have to do. You have to look at the historical context. You have to look at the linguistic context. Uh, and when we do that, we see that seven heavens is basically uh, a phrase that means the seven planets and the sun and the moon included. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, you know, um, we're sort of a little bit off the issue of when, you know, whether if it's the verse actually says that stars were created at this time. Uh, so let me just say well, even, that... Even if, you, yeah. even if you strike that, mm -hmm. uh, it's still saying that the sun and the moon are, and, and, or the planets, the other planets, were created after the Earth. I mean, whether you, even if you just focus on, just say, Mars. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. clearly Mars was not created after the Earth. So um, that's, I mean, so e e no matter how you try to look at it, it it's not going to fit with science. I mean, what what verse are you talking about? Uh, 4112. When it, when it mentions the seven heavens, right. when it mentions that he completed and finished it. Oh, according to that interpretation you gave. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no, other, no, no other interpretation that you can give without basically throwing out the whole thing as not saying anything of interest to science. I see. Well, um, okay, I'll, I'll get to your point about how we should interpret seven heavens. Um, but, you know, I just want you, you mentioned about the English word adorned. Um, okay, and, and this is what I was mentioning. Even in the English, it's clear. You don't need to even go to the Arabic for this. It, sure. Adorned does not say in any way, shape, or form means create. And oh, if you yes. look at the actual... It, it does mean moving. Or like, you know, if the, st if the stars were already hanging there, mm -hmm. then they were already adorning uh, mm -hmm. the lowest heaven. So, so, I mean, they either had to have been moved 
or something had to have happened to them but, but uh, see, for that, for that yeah. verb to be justified. I but mean, see, whether they were created yeah. or not, it doesn't matter. If you went to the Arabic dictionary and you looked up the word, which really that's what we should be doing when we do this type of sure, research, sure. you know, you're going to see the word zayana. It just means to beautify. And so just leave it at that rather than saying, well, you know, it should also mean this and that. And, 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 I, see, and I see, so I just want to leave it. I don't see anything about creating stars inside this verse. I think we should just leave it as beautify and that's it. And so about the seven heaven and you but, say, well, well, now are you saying that that so uh, that we're going to separate this sentence beautifying away from the whole chronological sequence so that he's not beautifying the last on the last two days that that this, this sort of some sort of general beautifying that happened at some other point in the creation? Well, I, I believe you can go you can take it in chronological order that he beautified the lower heavens with stars. What it means, I don't know, but. Uh, you know, okay. I just leave it at that. Well, you know, that, that, that's fair enough. Um, yeah. And I think if, if you go it that direction, um, then, of course, you, you're pulling the rug out from underneath these other Muslims who would want these passages to mean something scientifically. And I'd be gladly you, to you, do you that. You don't know what it means, and you, and you, you basically destroy your apologetic, which, which yeah. is kind of what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. So I think we're sort of on the same team almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a middle ground. Certainly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and there's a, you're going to read so much stuff out there, and that's why you have to know what to take and what to leave off from people. Just because someone claims they're Muslim or atheist or Christian, you just can't take their writings you know, at verbatim. But, yeah, uh, uh, that's true uh, for any religion, yeah. Yeah. Now, the thing about the about the seven heavens, you know, and about, well, let's interpret it according to what other people in history meant as seven heavens, uh, that is not the way the author of the Quran actually intended for us to, to, to use a book and how he wanted us to use it. And I'll quote to you a verse in just a second. Right. And that's kind of, um, I don't see that as being very accurate because what if those people got what seven heavens meant wrong also. So that would be wrong, one wrong interpretation from them carrying on into the Quran. Well, but here, then you would expect him to correct them. I mean, if he doesn't uh, correct them, then he's assuming that they're speaking the same language he is, which, of course, he has to assume that if he's going to communicate with people. I mean, you have to assume that you, your words mean the same thing that other people mean by those words. Otherwise, they're not going to understand you. And so it's a fair, I mean, it's a given assumption that when someone uses a term or a phrase that's in popular use around you, uh, that that's what you mean. And, and if you didn't mean that, really, I mean, it's really a moral obligation to mm. be clear and say, no, I don't mean what everybody else means. Sure. And let's, then we can, we can look into that. What did the Arabs, you know, during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, how did they understand what seven heavens meant or something like that? Sure. And that, that may be, uh, one way we can go about it. But here's what it says inside chapter three, verse seven. And this is really a general guideline how the author of the Quran gave us to understand the Quran. It says there, it is he who has sent down to you Muhammad the book. It, Muhammad's in parentheses. Sure. In it are verses that are entirely clear. They are the foundations of the book, uh, the farai, and then, and then the hudud, which are, I guess, the duties, obligatory duties. Mm -hmm. and, and then it goes, and others not entirely clear. So as for those in whose hearts there is deviation, they follow that which is not entirely clear thereof. Seeking fitna, meaning trying to make some kind of trouble, and seeking for its hidden meanings, but none know the hidden meaning save Allah. And those who are firmly grounded in knowledge say, we believe in it, the whole of it, both the clear and the unclear are from the Lord. So basically, what, I, what I'm saying here is that, you know, there's going to be clear verses in the Quran, and then there's going to be stuff which is vague and ambiguous. When, when we come to those verses... Leave it alone. Don't say, okay, well, let's look at it like uh, your psychological state or let's look at it like, you know, uh, four to seven different races or stuff like that. Just leave it alone. Go on right. what is clear. And let's um, debate yeah. on the clear stuff. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't object to that method, actually. It, it, I can see how it would be problematic for the religionist um, if you're faced with a book, half of which you don't even, only Allah knows what it means. Uh, it's not a very useful book, you know, from, from my perspective. Um, and, and, of course, also, I mean, you, as you know, as, as a free thinker, I object to the idea that you would declare faith in something that you don't even know what it means. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, I mean, I object to that on principle. Of course, that's not what my essay is about. But still, uh, that, that does bring up that other issue of, of uh, the ethics of belief. Mm -hmm. But if you read the verse again, well, first of all, the Quran, it's not half of the verses which are unclear in the Quran. Well, I know. I, I didn't mean it. To right. There are some which you're going to have to just say, I don't know what that means. Right. But here's what the author of the Quran tells you inside chapter 3, verse 7. 
the, what you're going to get out of here are the foundation, the obligatory duties. You're going to the concept so of it's salvation. It's an ethical book, is what you're saying, not a science book. The Quran is not a book of science; it is a book of science. Yes. Now, I do, like I said, we can talk about what are some of the verses which do match up with science right. later on. But uh, so, what you're going to get out of the book, you're going to get stuff which are clear. What is expected of you? What not to do, and the, and sure. the general. Sure. But yes, there are some verses you're going to have to leave alone. Now, if, you, if that's something you personally don't like, I guess that's your own uh, prerogative. But uh, now about the now the thing about the seven heavens. When it comes to that, we should just leave it alone and not sit here and say, okay, well, let's look at what the Romans said, what seven heavens meant. Let's let's look at what Farrakhan said, what seven he heavens meant. No, we're not going to do this. Just leave it alone. So can we agree upon that methodology? Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I'll agree um, that that methodology sh shares the same end as mine, really, that, uh, that it's basically declaring that the... The, uh, the apologetic that the Koran contains science, at least in this particular case, or the cases where you can't understand it, uh, that that apologetic fails. I mean, we, I don't entirely agree with, with the rejection of the historical linguistic context of, of a text, uh, but it, ha it seems both of our positions have the same end, and of course your position is sufficiently cautious that uh, I wouldn't call it unethical. Uh, in the way that I would call someone unethical who, who reads whatever they want in the book and then says it's absolutely true, that their opinion is correct. Your position is much more ethical in that respect. Oh, okay. Okay. Then, um... By the way, you know, we have uh, 20 minutes left to the top yeah. of the hour at the end of the show, so... Oh, so we got 20 minutes left for, to sum up our discussion? Um, yeah. So, uh, well, if, if there's anything you want to, to bring up again, go ahead. But what I thought we might do is uh, we'll open up the phones and at the same time... Maybe we can open up the discussion to other verses in the Quran relating to science. Okay. Uh, but if you have anything you wanted to say, go right ahead. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I wanted to, uh, Did you say something, Reggie? Yes, uh, I want to get that number out real quickly. Uh, for those of you listening, once again, you're listening to a um, uh, discussion uh, between uh, Nadir Ahmed and Richard Carrier talking about uh, uh, Nadir has some um, perspectives on uh, Richard Carey's essay, Cosmology and the Quran, and we're talking about that, as well as maybe going into some other things. Please call in 404-696-2864 with your questions. Okay, you know, Nadir, you're about to say something? Okay, yeah, uh, so just to sum up this point, then, um, you know, I guess you made an issue in your article about that the star is being created after the Earth, and then the whole thing about the interpretation of the seven heavens, meaning seven planets, we're just gonna we're gonna accept that no we're just gonna leave it the way it is and not add more interpretation in there right uh, so that I'll, I'll mention that I'll actually include that in uh, in a revision to the essay okay that's good that's good uh, okay now about the whole thing about pagan borrowing um, and uh, what you mentioned on that and I and I guess that's a common uh, question which a lot of people which I've been reading a lot of articles. Um, now, I guess what, what our understanding about this is that that's really an objection which is more fitted for, I guess, Jews and Christians and their scripture. Because their scripture, it, they have a type of exclusionism in it, meaning that God gave a revelation to this community of people who were the Israelites. They got the truth. And the other people, they're in darkness. They are in falsehood. Right. So, when you see that in their books, let's say the story of the flood, or the seven heavens, as you mentioned. That's also inside the Bible. Yeah. And you see the pagans, which predated those books, sure. uh, is in there, then that's the problem. Wait a second, you told me this stuff is only from God. So it creates a problem for that religion. But when it comes to Islam, I, I, I don't think it creates any problem. Actually, it actually generates a lot of interest on my part, because <laughs> what we believe is that what is stated in the Quran is that, uh, that God sent a messenger to every nation of people on earth. And it says that in, in many different verses. Uh, one would be... I mean, that, what, where you're going with that, though, it implies that, for instance, Lucretius, I mean, all the things he got right about science, even though he shows us his line of reasoning, he shows the logic of it and so forth, you're saying that then that must be a revelation from Allah that he couldn't have thought of it himself? Oh, no, not at all. Uh, I guess I was more referring to the seven heavens. You right. Know, or, or, you know, not, not just seven, not only just seven heavens. You also have to realize that the seven heavens is also mm -hmm. doesn't correspond to any scientific reality, which, if, if I mean, if we go to the, the popular mm -hmm. seven heavens. Uh, well, we, we don't know what it means. That's right, the whole right. thing. I, mean, I have right, no idea what it means. I'll get past that, right. Yeah. Uh, well, see, here's the thing why it sort of generates a lot of interest, you know, in me, because um, 
what this verse actually implies is that from China to, you know, to America to the Eskimos, that God sent a messenger to those people. Now it is it is very possible and it is expected that fragments or portion of that message which is from God did survive through the generations and did make its way into those people's book. So and when we as Muslims see that, you know, when we see, for example, people having a belief in one God or maybe in a in in a in Adam, you know, as being the sure, first man, sure. which are part of our belief, that doesn't you know, that is a very good explanation for it. And the Quran goes on, it says, For every nation we have appointed religious ceremonies that they mention that they may mention the name of God over beasts and cattle and it goes on about messengers being sent to all of mankind. Yeah, the Christians had also come to this, say this, come to argue this uh, same way. Uh, but that's not from their the books. By the time we get to Eusebius, uh, I don't know if it has any legitimate biblical support. Uh, but by the time of the fourth century, Eusebius, for example, prominently uh, uses this apologetic that, that everybody got a little piece of the gospel, but only the Christians have the, the whole of the gospel. Right, but that's really not coming from the Bible or their text that's more um, I guess you know guesswork on their part or apologetics maybe. Uh, un- unless it's in Paul's letters I, I won't say that yeah I, there, we'll I look into know. that yeah but so I guess for us that's not a that's not a problem at all yeah I, I can understand that mm-hmm. particular argument mm-hmm. um, I mean it, it, it it's kind of like I think it's like having your cake and eating it too but uh, still I, I, I understand uh, where you're going with that mm-hmm. and we're going to find some evidences uh, why we believe that there's no religious that this is not a case of religious borrowing. Uh, and I, I only, unfortunately, brought one of them with me today. <laughs> but that's the whole issue of the Noah's Flood. We know that this is something which is also inside many of the pagan religions and, you know, also inside the Christian scriptures. Yeah, R- Reddy and I actually talked about this last mm-hmm. time I was on the show. <laughs> oh, okay, great. <laughs> about the multiculturalism and, and the differences among the flood, flood myths. Yeah, and, uh, you know, they believe in a worldwide flood, which, you know, today's scientists tell us, no, this is not correct, that the whole world was engulfed with water. Am I correct on that? Uh, no, that, yeah, there's definitely uh, all evidences to the contrary of the whole world being flooded. Uh, recently, there was a discovery of the possibility that the uh, entire, I, I believe it was the Black Sea area, uh, came flooded over several centuries, and that this had the effect of instilling in the memory of primordial man mm-hmm. about 30,000 years ago. Uh, leading to this, the origin of the flood myth. Um, last time I was on the show, I actually argued against this because I, I think the evidence shows particular regional sources for each flood myth. Um, but, but I mean, it, the, the worst, most devastating flood that science can demonstrate is the Black Sea, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I guess, you know, from from my readings also, I guess, you know, I, then I would say some scientists disagree with that. I guess what majority of scientists do, disagree with a worldwide flood and also, um, they disagree with the ark being so big that it's carrying two pairs of every single animal on that ark. Well, yes. <laughs> you don't need to be a scientist to find that a little odd. Right. And I guess there's also historical evidence showing that that people lived during the time which they are which they are saying. And so, but when we read the Quran, we also see the flood story in there. So, you know. Upon first glance, you know, a skeptic would say, oh, that was just copied from the Bible or from the people before. But when it tells us inside about the flood, it does not say that there was a worldwide flood. Rather, it talks about, about Noah's people drowning, just his community of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's inside chapter 25, verse 37. So this is just some, some of the evidence. I know it's not complete. I have to show more to uh, prove that, but to show you that this is, not a case of simply one borrowing from the other, because if this was a case of borrowing, then that scientific mistake of a worldwide flood would have carried on over into the Quran. Well, actually, that, that's a good example, because the worldwide flood had already been refuted uh, centuries before that. Mm-hmm. Um, it was already a point of contention between pagans and Christians and argued out, and the Christians got burned on it. Mm-hmm. The, uh, uh, so by the time you see the, the Quran uh, approaching, uh, maybe they were, you know, finally receiving the detritus of this debate and just taking a much more uh, safer position, I guess, regarding that. Not declaring that the whole world is flooded, but just saying uh, that just a part of the world is flooded. Um, and that's actually a common thing. I mean, even where we know for what there was borrowing, uh, the Greek flood myth, for instance, is clearly borrowed from Samaria, but it was transformed. It was transformed in many ways indicative of Greek culture. They made it their own, you know, that they changed the story for the to fit their own cultural assumptions. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I would imagine anything that's borrowed in the Quran 
has done the same thing. And then, of course, the, the, the way it takes the creation story, which is very similar to the one in the Bible, it makes a few changes in the, in the order of things or in the way they're presented. That's, that's, making, that's borrowing it and making it your own, which is what uh, cultural diffusion is all about. It happens very often. I mean, it's a natural feature of cultural borrowing. Yes, if that in case did happen, but of course we believe that it didn't happen. Now, what year did you say this debate took place? Um, oh, it, it took a place over several centuries. Uh, I can't exactly identify who um, argued it. Was uh, it before the time of the Quran? Or? Oh, well, certainly, yes. Uh, in fact, it was really, to be fair, it was before Christianity. The uh, Euhemerus is one of the first authors, I believe, who starts taking issue with the, the uh, myth. Uh, but there were several other authors in the Hellenistic period most of whom don't survive, their works don't survive, but quotations from them and references to them survive from many centuries later, uh, from the Hellenistic period, where they were basically picking on Greek myths and saying, these are absurd, these things didn't happen. Uh, and, and a lot of that happened, and this happened before the time of Christ. Uh, and so that by the time you know, Christianity is starting to flourish and it's sort of resting on top of uh, the, the Jewish Old Testament, um, a lot of pagans... You know, who considered themselves sophisticated, had read all of this debunking of mythology from the Hellenistic period and, of course, started picking on, on the Jewish myths and then, of course, on the Christians for believing that. Uh, now, of course, they didn't have nearly the kind of scientific information that we did. Nobody could really prove their position back then. Uh, but the, the idea of, of challenging it, the idea of doubting it, um, of rewriting the history so that it's only a regional flood rather than a worldwide one, that had already taken place just out of ordinary human reasoning. Uh, during the Hellenistic period, which is, which is before, uh, before the expansion of the Roman Empire in 31 B.C. So, okay. uh, so this, this stuff had happened already. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, once again, it, it shows that, that humans are very smart, humans are clever, uh, very adaptable, uh, but it doesn't show anything to do with science or, you know, the, the anticipation of modern science, let's say. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So what I see, what I need to do, then, you know, I mean, it's a good start as far as producing evidence, but I think I need to show a lot more on that. Maybe in the future we can we can we can come to this topic again. Uh, now uh, I don't know how much time we have left. Yeah, we have ten minutes now. Ten minutes. Yeah. Okay, I got I got some more here. Okay. Uh, so I mean, basically, just to sum up the thing about religious borrowing, um, we can make any kind of theories we want, but as far as really showing, you know, evidence, and not just for a, for you know your, to convince yourself, but. I guess we should look at our audience as being all the Muslims out there. Okay, here. Here's why you shouldn't believe in the Quran because et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see a lot of um, strong evidence to support religious borrowing. Uh, you know, and so I guess just saying, okay, well, this existed there, this existed there. Well, actually, you know. the, the argument works the other way around. Um, I mean, first of all, it's, if, if you just take the Quran as something written by a guy, you know, it's just a normal human, human book, then there's no issue. Mm -hmm. When you say that the Quran uh, has proof within it that it was inspired by a god, now you're making what's called an extraordinary claim. And so the burden of proof is on you to establish that this book is exceptional. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is rule out the other causes of what's in the Quran. If you can't rule them out, I mean, I don't have to prove that those are the causes. All I have to show is that those could have been the causes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have to sit there and actually rule them out. If you can't rule them out, then you cannot say with any certainty that anything in the Quran is divinely inspired. Oh, so uh, you're that, saying that's it's the structure of the argument. I, you're just saying it's a possibility. Well, yes. I mean, that's, I see. The, you, you don't have enough, or what you would say is you don't have sufficient evidence to believe it's divinely inspired. And, and that's really the position that I take in the essay. Okay. All right. Well, that's, all right. I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, let, me, let me just uh, bring on another, uh, another point which I, which I was wondering here. You, you mentioned that inside Arabic that, um, you know, uh, let me find what I got lost here. Okay. Um, that the whole thing about hot gases, that you, you, you said that I'm sure that uh, the Quran, the Arabic does not lack the word for hot gases. And or I guess, or, or words. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't emphasize that there has to be a word, uh, but I'm sure it had the words to say something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, what exactly would that be then? What the Arabic would be? Yeah. No, that I don't know. Um, the place to look would be in the Arabic translations of uh, Hero's Pneumatic. Mm -hmm. um, Hero is a Greek uh, a scientist who wrote on pneumatic, which is the study of pressure and gases. Uh, and there were some Arabic translations of that. And if you want to look for the vocabulary, that would be the place to look. I see. Because I, here I just found my notes here. It says you wrote that Arabic does not lack the vocabulary to simply say hot gases or hot gases expanding in a vacuum or anything even remotely relevant to the truth. So I guess 
you know, when we look at the Arabic, 1,400 years ago, I did not find anything which would describe hot gases or hot gases expanding in a vacuum. Well, surely you, you, you could have found, you, you know, words that would uh, say something that's clearer on that point than smoke. Well, I mean, I guess when I look at this, what I understood from you mentioning this is somehow you've done the research and you found a word which says hot gases or hot gases expanding well, no, in a vacuum. Well, no, I, I, I actually did not. Okay. Um, what, what I assumed is that since we have Arabic translations of pneumatic science mm -hmm. and written only about 100, 200 years after the Quran, uh, if they could do that without using the word smoke, then surely the author of the Quran could have done. And I, and I seriously doubt that Arabic, Arabic was such a restricted, limited language uh, that it had a smaller vocabulary than Latin, and Latin has a notoriously small vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I mean, if you want to say that Arabic has an even smaller vocabulary than Latin, that's a pretty extraordinary claim. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, even in Latin, you can come up with, I mean, if you read Lucretius' De Rerum Natura, I mean, he comes into some very articulate descriptions of cosmology that come much closer and much clearer to modern theories than, uh, than what we're looking at here in 4111, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he, he, he discusses, for instance, the concept of atoms and atoms combining into molecular structures to produce uh, the effect that we call elements. I mean, he, here he is, he's anticipating Lavoisier, he's anticipating modern chemistry, the periodic table, uh, you know, atomic theory, uh, all just from sheer reason. I mean, he, he just goes through and is logically arguing it out. It's not based on really much evidence or anything. It's, it's not even scientific. It's not. He's not saying it's divinely inspired. Uh, it's just sheerly reasoning out that it, it's very logical. Uh, and now, if he can do this in Latin, even, you know, and this is, you know, Latin, that's quite an achievement. Surely it could have been done in Arabic. Okay, that's kind of an assumption then. Well, I, I think it's a more than justified assumption. Okay. Um, okay, let me move on very quickly here. Um, you mentioned that the historical documents concerning Muhammad are murky at best. Were you referring to the Hadith? Um, well, uh, the Hadith comes much later anyway. Uh, well, if we talk, for instance, of documents written or available within his lifetime or within 50 years of it, can you even name a single document? Which is written in sites within 50 years within of... Within 50 years of, or, or let's say even 100 years, mm -hmm. uh, about, uh, well, no, yeah, within 100 years, mm -hmm. about uh, the writing of the Quran, about the life situation of, well, actually, we should probably say 50 years, because wild legends about Jesus were already rising within 100 years of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were writings, like, I guess, within 100 years, but as far as authentic writings... Yeah, uh, exactly. Well, that's, that's what I mean. I mean... Yeah. How, how, how are you even going to establish what the historical facts yeah. are? Uh, I, I, I have read some of historians trying to reconstruct the era, and all you see in there is just common, constant references to the paucity of materials and the, the difficulty of trying to interpret uh, what's true and what's not and, and what the date, original dates of stories are and so forth. Um, that's what I mean by murky. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, that would go on into a discussion on the science of hadith and how hadith was preserved from generation to generation. So, we'll, so I guess... Uh, yeah, that, that, I will say, is outside my area of expertise. Yeah, and that's outside of mine, too, so I wouldn't <laughs> be able to do it. <laughs> so, I, so I guess when you meant that the, the historical documents are murky, I guess you, you weren't referring to hadith, or were you then? No, no, I was just saying oh. that, that uh, what materials we do have available are just, you can't pin them down as to what's true or even what was written in that period. Uh, I mean, we just don't have any certain reliable information uh, that we can say, yes, we know this happened, in the way we do, for instance, for the Roman emperors, uh, to take a, a prominent example. Mm. Well, Arjun, we only have about six minutes left. What yep. I'd like to do is give each of you, oh, we've got five minutes left. What I'd like to do is give each of you um, maybe a minute and a half each to maybe uh, uh, sum up uh, the gist of your argument here. Uh, I guess we did it earlier, but since the progress of the... Right, discussion right. has moved on. Maybe we can go ahead and, and start ending it right here. All right. Um, well, I'll just start. I mean, basically, uh, I, I think this has been a very interesting discussion. It's uh, nice to speak to a Muslim who's much more rational <laughs> and uh, and calm-headed than, than the ones I've run into uh, before. And uh, and, and I, I like the way that you, you're approaching this. It's, it's uh, what I would say is a more enlightened uh, approach to uh, Islam. Indeed. Um, and basically, my essay is not even against this kind of uh, more liberal, more, uh, I can't think of the right uh, adjective for it, this, this different approach. It's more against the sort of hardline fundamentalists uh, who are like 
Christian fundamentalists who are, who are much more extreme than, for instance, the liberal Christians, uh, by whose side I even fight on many occasions for, for instance, on church state separation. I call several Christians my, my close friends. So uh, it's nice to see that there we can actually find some uh, Muslims who take Islam in the same direction that these Christians have. Um, okay. Should I just go? Okay, well, yeah. uh, well, you know, I, just to, you know, uh, carry on to what uh, Rich was saying, I, I really enjoy this discussion, and I, and I think this is a way which, uh, you know, all religious discussions should carry out with mutual respect and in a very courteous environment. I, I absolutely agree, yeah. uh, and, and, and I miss it in a way. I mean, it, it just doesn't happen enough. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I think, uh, summing up, you know, the article, I think he brings up some very good facts. And I think this is the type of criticism every religion needs, especially, like you mentioned, certain people who are retrofitting and making claims about the book, which it really don't even say. The whole thing about making smoke analogous with, you know, um, with, with gases and showing that, that's vague and ambiguous. And that is why I think, you know, this, this type of criticism is very good. Um, and I think, you know, one thing whenever I, what, what keeps me in line whenever I do this type of research, uh, Carl Sagan, he wrote a, a balony detection kit. And um, I always yeah. use it so that, you know, I don't catch myself into running into errors. <laughs> and um, one advice which I, I always like to fo- follow when I do this stuff is that it says, he point out that spin more than one hypothesis. Don't simply run with the first idea that caught your fancy. Sure, yeah. yeah. And then he goes on saying, try not to get overly attached to a hypothesis just because it's yours. <laughs> And so that's yeah. something which I'd like to probably uh, recommend for everyone who's listening here today. And what I find is that I think that um, as far as there being a clear scientific error in the Quran, uh, in explicit term, in the clear verses mm-hmm. which was mentioned in the Quran, mm-hmm. no, I don't see that. But I think once we delve into that issue of interpretations, well, let's interpret things this way, that's when things get muddy and clearly, you know, and, and, and you really cannot clearly define uh, what it's actually saying, and on those type of verses, just leave them alone, because probably you'll never figure out what it means. <laughs> so that's all I have to say on that. Okay. Well, all right. Well, our gentlemen, I'd like to thank both of you guys for uh, coming on and thank discussing this. I had a great time. Um, you know, I have since no one called in, I guess I make a few comments. Uh, I had a, some some difficulty myself with understanding how one can just let something go, so to speak, if it's. Um, in a book that one adheres to be true. Um, I have some difficulty with that. Um, I also have some difficulty with how can one make reference, or how can a book make reference to something that is known mythology and then ignore it? I find that a little difficult as well. Earlier, uh, Nadir, you talked about uh, the seventh heaven concept, and I don't want to you know, you know, just continue to dwell on that, but we did, that was mentioned, and I know I... I'm going to start doing some more research on that myself because I, I was I understood that as well to be an ancient old pagan ritual and belief that uh, predated uh, Islam, uh, you know, many many hundreds of years. So, uh, but anyway, I just thought I'll just come out and say that those are some things I've had some difficulty with. And once again, I, I really enjoyed you guys, and I'll have this show available at the website. And I and I dear hope I hope to have you back on, and we can have a, probably a more engaging discussion uh, in the future. Oh, okay. Between you and I, because I know you mentioned you want, and I think we may we can probably do this September 11th. We can talk about a few things then. <laughs> oh, okay, that sounds good. Okay, and uh, so shoot me an email, and I'll talk to you guys uh, 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 later. Okay. And once again, I'll shoot. You, also, I'll email you guys with the link to where you can download this for yourselves. All right. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for appearing, guys. Okay. Bye. All right. Thanks bye. For this is the Atheist Radio Network. Jesus is working on you, and you're going to become a Christian, and you're going to lead many people to Christ, and I can't wait. Who, me?